let's go back to the sort of the, the person who's listening to us who wants to take the plunge, wants to start doing resistance training. Um, they're clinging to what you said a while ago that, hey, I can get some really good results if I'm in the gym 30 minutes twice a week. And I know that Mike trains eight hours a week, but I don't need to be Mike. Um, it's a lot. So tell me what a program looks like. Let's construct the program for the pick. Let, let's do it as a young, let's start with a young person. Let's start with a young person who actually has been somewhat active throughout their life, but it's, it's mostly been in sports, right? They play tennis, they play, you know, uh, they, they did cross country in high school. Um, they've just never been a gym rat. Sure. But they've listened to this podcast enough. They've listened to you enough to know like, hey, there's value in in uh, developing strength. And, sure. and, and and I'd like to have some hypertrophy. I want to I look a little better. Sure. Okay. So I'm coming to you. I'm 40 years old. Um, kind of a little intimidated if I'm truthful, right? Don't know what Good. to do. Good. I have do. a whole pack bounce to make you more intimidated. <laughs> so what's our, what's, our, what's our two 30 minute day workout look yeah. like? So I'll describe to you what week one could look like, and then I'll tell you how to scale that afterwards. It's not just the same every single week. Yeah. So what you want to do is if you're training twice a week, let's call it Monday and Thursday for simplicity, you do want some symmetry. So you don't want a situation in which you train with weights Monday, Tuesday, and then you take the rest of the week to do other stuff. If you only train twice a week, you want it to be roughly evenly spread. So Monday, Thursday, Wednesday, Friday, that sort of thing. And because your muscles don't take usually a whole week to recover, but if you push them hard, maybe at most half a week, you can train every major muscle group of your body in every single session that you do. So both Monday and Thursday will have every major muscle group being trained. Routines that have the muscle group separated are called split routines, you know, chest one day, back the next. Mostly pro bodybuilders are the only ones that benefit from that sort of thing. And there's a lot of nuance about how to execute that sort of thing. So whole body training is probably best for almost everyone who is trying to get the health benefits, longevity benefits, the aesthetic benefits, and so on and so forth. So the next thing you want to do is you want to conserve time, but you want a high degree of effect. And that's going to impose some recommendations on us that do both of those things. One recommendation is to choose lifts, to choose exercises that involve two components. One is large muscle masses. So you're not going to be doing a lot of like forearm curls or tibialis anterior calf raises where like the muscle you're training is like as much muscle as your pinky finger. And that's about it. You're going to be training muscles like the quadriceps, the glutes, the hamstrings, the musculature of the back, the chest, the shoulders, the arms, etc. And choosing exercises that train those muscles, preferably not just one muscle at a time. So then we're using muscles uh, very efficiently because we're pushing multiple muscles to their limits in one exercise. This is generally going to be compound movements, multi-joint movements, things like pull-ups, pull-downs, barbell and dumbbell bent over rows that for the back at least engage the forearm flexion muscles, the biceps, etc. They engage actually the muscles of the forearm themselves through your grip. They engage the posterior aspect of your deltoids, the rear delts. They engage almost every muscle in the back all at the same time. Now you do one set of bicep curls, but I do one set of underhand pull-ups. I got my biceps checked off and I got three other muscles checked off. You just have one. One of my absolute grotesque pet peeves is to see personal trainers in major cities training their regular clients, housewife who's 55, and having her do like rear delt cable fly one at a time. I'm like, oh my God, is that one made of time? And also, is there some kind of physique show which the judges said she needs bigger rear delts but nothing else? <laughs> That's the only reason you should be doing that nine times out of 10. <laughs> so compound movements, close grip bench presses, push-ups, overhead presses, upright rows, squats, deadlifts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are the kind of movements that train multiple muscles at the same time. And thus, they are insanely time efficient because you do a few exercises and you're like, holy crap, that's all of my upper body. If you do some kind of rowing machine, you do some kind of machine or barbell or dumbbell that's a close grip press, you do some kind of upright row situation, then you've technically trained kind of every single muscle in your upper body to a substantial extent because every single exercise trains three or four muscles at a time. 
So those are the kind of movements we're going to be leaning into the most. What about for the lower body? Same idea. So besides if, a deadlift and a squat, so RDL. various stiff legged deadlift or good morning RDL is the same category of movement that trains your entire back, uh, specifically your spinal erector musculature, which is insanely important for healthy aging. I could talk about that ad nauseum. And, um, then it trains your glutes and it trains your hamstrings and it trains your sartorius and parts of your adductors. And it actually trains your calves too. Holy crap. That's one, that's one exercise. You integrate some kind of lunging pattern into that or some kind of squatting pattern, be it a hack squat, leg press, barbell squat, you name it. And all of a sudden you've run out of muscles to train in your lower body because everything has been uh, done to a high degree of diligence. Again, compound movements. Uh, again, I see 45 year old financial advisors who don't have a lot of time. They have family obligations. They have work obligations. They have other hobbies and they're doing like leg extensions in the gym. I'm always like, man, I hope that guy's hurt and has a good reason to be doing those because if he's not squatting or lunging or doing leg presses or something, he's just using up time in the gym, training one thing at a time for no good reason at all. So invariably, you've been asked this a thousand times, but um, when this person's coming into this situation and they don't have a high training history, what are the tools you use to teach them how to do these compound movements safely, especially the lower body ones, right? So squats and deadlifts, Admittedly, they're not going to be starting out with a ton of weight, but that's the biggest tool. Yeah. Is starting out with low weight. There's no movement the human body can do which unloaded and doesn't, and not pushing the muscles and tendons to their extreme has any higher risk probability than any other movement. So you can start with a deadlift or a squat that's body weight or less. You can brace your arms on a Smith machine and unload yourself while you squat. That may be where you have to start. You take multiple sets like that that are very submaximal. Ideally, you're there with a personal trainer. If not, you can just go to YouTube and type in the name of your exercise and it'll pop up. We have a huge library for free on YouTube. Actually, the RPI Hypertrophy app, which is one of our apps in our app suite, has every exercise you'll ever see in there, has a video demonstration one click away. So you look at that. Ideally, you would have a personal trainer because uh, live communication about how to exercise uh, is irreplaceable. Because on a video, we're assuming that your assessment of what that is, is your assessment of what you're doing. Which is very difficult. Oh my God. You walk into a gym and they're like, I'm squatting. You're like, that, and that's not a squat. I don't know what the hell someone told you or what video you're looking at. That ain't it. But if you have a personal trainer, they can be like, ooh, that's really good, but I want you to move your hips back more. I want you to move down more, so on and so forth. But basically, the first time you're ever with someone in a session, all you do is you take them through those movement patterns, fine tune their technique with lots of encouragement. And you're not seeking perfection, you're just seeking basic competency. Get your heels on the ground, get you squatting all the way down, get your back nice and straight. Listen, that's all we want. And you'll do three or four of those, what are really warm up sets, and you'll just kick them out of the gym. Three or four warm up sets per exercise. It's a teaching session. They never even lifted heavy, they never pushed to failure. But because they're so unaccustomed to lifting, they'll get sore, and it's enough tension and disruption that they will grow muscle. The next time they come in, you work them through a different series of movements. Let's call it Monday, Thursday movements. The next week they come in and you do the same workout, except maybe that last set of every movement after a few technique oriented sets, you uh, ask them to go for slightly more repetitions, maybe not five, but now 10, or you put a little bit of weight on the bar, something that gets them like, Ooh, okay. I feel it. This is a challenge. And then over time, slowly every week, you increase the weight a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more until several weeks later, their technique looks real good, which most people can learn really good techniques. It's not that complicated in a few weeks. And now they're like kind of struggling with their weights. We're finally up to a weight and rep combination that's challenging them physiologically every set, not just neurologically for how to do the technique. That three or four week sort of entry period is amazing because it takes the probability of injury and just co almost completely eliminates it because you're not just going in there and seeing how strong you are on the first day, which believe it or not, a lot of people are inclined to do profoundly stupid as reserved for like high school or junior high kids <laughs> or if you're ninth grade, fuck it, max out. Don't do that when you're an adult. It's profoundly stupid, especially if you're in your forties and fifties and sixties and like you don't want a torn pec with you drive a truck for a living. Your pec is re required for that sort of thing. After that sort of, um, easing in period, you're now competent to the movements. You feel yourself competent as a member of general gym culture. You don't feel lost. A big part of a problem of getting people to go to gyms and actually stick with it is there's this understanding that people have, which is itself relatable, but inaccurate, 
that um, the gym is for people that know things. It's a their place. It's for that jacked guy. It's not for me. The thing is that Jack guy, to paraphrase another comedian, like he's been in the gym enough. You should take a few days off. You're big. You did it, buddy. The people who really need to be in the gym are the ones who aren't in the gym. So the gym is an infinitely welcoming place. Almost all the Jack people are super nice in real life. And they're not judging you. They're just staring off into space. They're ultra selfish. They don't care about you. <laughs> and if you don't know what you're doing, you can always ask them and they almost certainly will give you free advice until you're blue in the face. <laughs> so after a few weeks of being in the gym with a trainer, you're like, this is my place. I belong here. And I'm starting to push a little hard. And then over time, you just increase the load on the bar a little bit. And if you're no longer getting sore or really tired and sore and tired in such a way that you need until next Thursday to get sore and tired, you start increasing the number of working sets that you're doing. Because working sets wise up until this point was just one working set really if you think about it. In the first week or two, zero working sets. They're all practice sets because you're so untrained, they're work sets for you, but they're not to anyone else that's watching. A few weeks in, one work set. A few weeks after, two work sets. And so on and so on and so on until you're doing anywhere between three and six working sets per exercise. But there's another twist here for the person that wants to save a lot of time and actually get some cardiovascular benefits as well. You take exercises that are responsible for training muscles that can be paired with other exercises, which train muscles that are totally or mostly unrelated. If I do a seated dumbbell shoulder press, I rack those dumbbells, I can walk over and do some goblet squats. And essentially there's almost no muscle overlap, or I can do some deadlifts and there's just no muscle overlap whatsoever. And so I could do some seated dumbbell shoulder presses, Put, put it down, nice hard set, good job, two sets left. And I could sit for the average of one or two minutes and scroll on my phone. But if you're really time conscious and you want extra cardiovascular benefit, what you can do is as soon as you've finished with one group of muscles, you take five or 10 seconds, shake it out, breathe it out, hit the next working set for that paired exercise. While you're doing that exercise, the muscles for the first exercise are actually recovering locally. And so when you're done with exercise, five or 10 seconds later, it's set two for the first exercise. So you pair these unrelated work sets together, unrelated exercise, such that when you've done four sets of one exercise, let's say a close grip bench press that trains the pushing muscles of your body, if you've paired that with a row or a lat pull down, then really you've done eight total working sets and you've just knocked off 80% of your entire upper body in an amount of time that the dumbbell press by itself guy has just finished only his front delts and triceps. So rest times in the gym outside of getting a drink or just try not to faint are probably not your best friend if you're just going for general health, general aesthetics, this kind of stuff, especially beginning. So you're either working one muscle group or several with one exercise or you're transitioning between exercises, or you're working the other one, or you're setting up your weights for your next machine that you're gonna be doing, which means as soon as you get in and warm up, it's go, 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 back to back to back to back, five or 10 seconds for transition to catch your breath barely, but you're really like, you're not gonna be talking to a lot of people at the gym other than how many sets do you have left in that machine, that kind of stuff. And so that allows us to condense a lot of work most people will need something like 15 to 30 total working sets for their whole body per session. You can condense that into 30 minutes, but you're working almost the entire time. And it's generally a good idea to do sets of 10 to 30 repetitions because those kinds of uh, loads, you don't need a ton of time to have your best performance. You can get good enough performances with a short time for recovery. And because it's a lot of reps, not only does it get you very meaningful strength increases, because the absolute load is lower, much lower injury risks. Look, you do one rep maxes all the time, you're going to have it coming one way or another. You never touch any weight that's heavier than a 10 rep max. The probability of injury in anyone given set is much, much smaller. And because it's a higher volume of work, you get a great hypertrophy stimulus and you get great cardiometabolic benefits. If you're breathing insanely heavy the entire time and sweating like a, you know, insert favorite analogy here, then you will be kind of one and twoing that session for a resistance training check mark and a pretty decent cardiovascular training check mark, especially if these are compound multi joint exercises that require you supporting your body in space, you do a set of 15 barbell squats, followed by a set of 15 push ups. Your cardio is working. 
I mean, that's what they torture boxers with, and their cardio is outlandish, back to back to back to back. It's resistance training, it's cardio, it's both. You have two sessions like that per week, each one lasting 30 minutes. You have two sessions of zone two, zone three cardio, where you're really trying, and four sessions total like that per week with good sleep and good body weight, good nutrition, you're well on your way to when you see your healthcare provider every year and he asks you, hey, trying to die sooner or later, and you tell them what you do, most will be like, well, that's way more than most of my patients do. And if you look at the American College of Sports Medicine requirements, various uh, requirements of what constitutes rigorous physical activity, you're getting well into the mix with a sum total, if we think about it, of two to three hours of difficult physical activity of any kind in a week. So when people say, I don't have time for exercise, I get it. I get it. I don't have children. I've heard that when you have children, time dilates like black hole type of stuff. Um, but you can probably make time at least for that resistance training session. Will it be ultra easy? No way. It's going to be really tough. I don't train like that. I need my break, damn it. I'm trying to be lazy and scroll on Instagram between sets. But if I wanted to get the maximum results for the minimum amount of time, we're working all the time. And over time, you start with one or two paired sets like that. You get up to three or four paired sets like that on five to eight exercises per session. Holy crap, that is a lot of work. And it will train your entire body in one session, and you will require one to three days of rest afterwards. Guess what? You rest for three days, you come back. You rest for three days, you come back. There's two workouts in a week. Each one takes about half an hour. And if you ever want the workouts to take less time, work faster <laughs> and rest less. And a lot of people want to hear like the hack for how to get really awesome results with very little time spent in the gym, but they don't want to hear how to get the hack actually going because they're like, well, hold on, hold on. What's going to hurt? Like, yeah, it's going to hurt. It's going to be miserable. Unless you accept the fact that, you know, all the benefits of endorphins and everything like that. It's kind of like, you know, how do you become a millionaire? So you're very, very good at something. You get very, very good people skills and you grind for years at starting your empire. Like, nah, man, I wanted like a win a lottery ticket or something. I didn't want all this. Like everyone knows that's how you become a billionaire. I don't want that. So yeah, you know, you can thumbnail and title this how you like, but um, it's cool to say, yeah, listen, one hour a week and you can have amazing benefits of health, quality of life. But I'm here to tell you real talk because at RP, that company that I represent, we just have a policy of never lying to people ever. Um, because we're doing this to honestly help people. And business-wise, if you start lying to people, it's hard to unweave the rainbow after that. Um, this is going to be tough. But also, there is now more and more research accumulating that doing difficult things physically is good for your mental health. Uh, there's a lot of publicity lately to cold plunges, uh, you know, Huberman and, and all that stuff. And a cold plunge, because it's so annoying, kind of makes you uh, more grateful for the not pain you're engaging in the rest of the day and it's really good for you. I have one better. You do a 30 minute session of back to back to back compound free motion or dumbbell or barbell or even machine work and sweat your balls off and huff and puff. The rest of the day seems like, like a breeze and the endorphin kick is massive. It's like surviving a traumatic episode. So the cold plunge has some benefits. I'm not entirely sold that they're enormous or extent whatsoever in many cases, but this kind of resistance exercise has benefits that if we just took one by one time to talk about on this podcast, we could talk about nothing else and do four podcasts in a row. That kind of massive benefit.